participant to join us. Thank you. So let's uh, we'll, uh, start in, in two minutes at 9.05. I have here no uh, 9.03 minutes. So we give it like two minutes and we can get started. Um, in case uh, Jeff, uh, sorry, in case Peter cannot make it to moderate the session, I asked uh, Scott to introduce you. Good morning, Scott. Morning, Jeff. Latifa, would you like me to introduce Jeff? Yes, please. I, uh, I'm checking if Peter joined us. He, he did not. I text him. Uh, I, don't, I didn't see any response right now. So maybe if you don't mind, just uh, no problem. introduce him. Like We can start in one minute. OK. OK. Thank you very much. I can see more people still joining. So in one minute, you can start introducing uh, Jeff uh, Scott, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's time. So again, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to today's exciting session with uh, Dr. Jeff Ginsberg. And uh, we have uh, Scott Sendit, who is going to introduce uh, Dr. Ginsberg. So, to you, uh, Scott, and thank you again. Thank you, Latifa, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce you all to Jeff Ginsberg. Uh, Jeff is the Chief Medical and Scientific Officer of the National Institute of Health's All of Us Research Program, where he leads the scientific vision and strategy. Previously, he was founding director at the Center for Applied Genomics and Precision Medicine at Duke University School of Medicine and held senior leadership roles at Millennium Pharmaceuticals. He's influenced precision medicine in the US and internationally, serving as co-chair of the National Academy's Roundtable on Genomic and Precision Health, a founding co-chair of the International Health Cohorts Consortium, and a founder and president of the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative. Uh, Jeff, it gives me great pleasure to have you talk to us today about the All of Us Research Program. Uh, thank you, Scott, and um, it's, a, it's a special pleasure to be at this educational seminar series that is um, 
uh, co-run by the GGMC and IHCC. And um, I, I'm really appreciative of Laftifa uh, uh, putting this together over the last couple of years and to hear from international experts on how uh, each of us is trying to advance uh, precision health and medicine. So what I wanna do is reflect for a moment on the power of longitudinal health studies. Uh, we're now celebrating the 76th anniversary of the Framingham study in Framingham, Massachusetts in the United States, which is really an iconic study, uh, which um, started in 1948. And in just 12 years studying just over 5,000 men and women, uh, we learned about major risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Uh, many of these are now part of uh, uh, clinical care and are used on a daily basis to evaluate the risks of developing heart disease for men and women across not only the United States, uh, but globally. And in addition, the adoption of these risk factors has uh, into clinical care has really had a significant impact on, um, on public health. As you can see uh, in these graphs on the right, there has been a significant decrease in the inc in the incidence and of more and the mortality from both coronary heart disease uh, stroke and cerebrovascular disease over the last uh, 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 four or five decades since the uh, descriptors of risk from the Framingham study. So, with that as a background, um, I think it's important to at least for us to reflect on what might be possible with a million people followed over time. And this is really the impetus for the All of Us research program in the United States. Our mission is at the top of this slide to accelerate health research, medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment and care for all of us. And the lowercase all of us in this mission statement is really to reflect on uh, our ability to uh, approach uh, all of these uh, opportunities for the diversity of people in the United States. Uh, so really taking a very strong and intentional commitment to bring people into research that have never been part of um, biomedical research in the past. And we're doing this um, through partnerships with uh, a million people eventually who reflect the diversity of the United States. Uh, we believe we've created one of the largest biomedical data sets that is broadly accessible to researchers now around the globe. And we're using this as a real magnet to catalyze researchers to come to the uh, and use our data uh, to innovate and to create and to uh, advance the field of precision medicine. In 2021, uh, our program developed a series of five uh, five five year goals. At the upper right, the first goal is to complete enrollment of a million participants reflecting the diversity of the United States across the lifespan. Uh, and the lower right is um, a data goal um, to make data available to researchers for um, a million participants and expand from our core protocol to other data types. And the mechanism by which we would expand our core protocol, and I'll tell you about uh, more, more details about this in a moment, is at the bottom is to launch what we call ancillary studies as a means to both bring in new participants that are not, uh, that haven't been part of the part, core protocol, but new data types that would expand opportunities for researchers uh, to use this as a magnet to attract um, a global diversity of researchers. And our goal for 2026 is 10,000, productively using uh, the All of Us data set. And importantly, a core value and principle of the program is reflected in the, in the fifth goal in the upper left, which is to return value to participants. So we are asking participants to, per, to provide information and data about them to us. And we want to reciprocate by providing value and information that they possibly can use in, uh, in managing their own health um, in the future. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Uh, last year, 2023 was a really a banner year for the program. These are uh, just a snapshot of some of the uh, accomplishments last year. We surpassed 750,000 consented participants with over 500,000 contributing a vast amount of data. We call these core participants if they completed enrollment, uh, provided uh, survey data at a biospecimen. We've maintained our goals for underrepresented uh, in biomedical research is what UBR stands for, or race and ethnicity, RE, with over 81% uh, underrepresented in biomedical research and 46% uh, of our participants self-reporting um, self-reported self having 
uh, non-white um, race and ethnicity. Uh, 500 and over 500,000 biospecimens uh, have been collected and we enrolled our first uh, pediatric uh, participant in December of 2023. At the top in the middle, you can see uh, how we're advancing research. Just again, a, a data snapshot. By the end of 2023, we had over 8,400 researchers. We had released over 245,000 whole genome sequences, and we had begun to sign agreements with um, data use and registration agreements, or DURAs, with uh, international organizations in six continents. And our commitment to return value to participants is illustrated in the middle here, uh, where we, by in 2023, we had already returned results, and I'll tell you more about this in a moment, to nearly 200,000 um, individuals, as well as we had launched two ancillary studies uh, around nutrition and as well as cognitive testing. And we celebrated our five-year anniversary since launch. So this is really a lot uh, if you consider that this program has only been around for uh, since 2018. This is a snapshot of our um, of our accomplishments with enrollments as of uh, about a month ago. Uh, 780,000 individuals are now, have now consented. 431,000 have donated their electronic uh, health records and over 550,000 have have, uh, have provided a bio uh, specimen to our biobank. And on the map of the United States that you see here, you can see uh, that we're enrolling in all 50 states in the United States, as well as some of our territories. And in, there's a, um, a high enrollment numbers are uh, in the Southwest and California and Arizona, as well as in the Northeast with New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and some of our Midwestern states are also uh, doing a great job at, at enrolling uh, participants in the program. In addition, I mentioned our commitment to um, uh, diversity uh, and representation. And on the left-hand side, you can see information on self-reported race and ethnicity with 47% of our participants indicating a non-white um, race and ethnicity with uh, a majority being Black, African-American or African, or Hispanic, Latino or Spanish and, and others. On the right-hand side are categories that we consider um, to have been underrepresented in biomedical research. In other words, people that have largely been excluded uh, from research and therefore are not represented in a number of the data sets that are used uh, uh, by researchers around the globe. So I mentioned that we have about um, we have a, a preponderance of individuals that uh, self-report as a non-white race, but we also include in the UBR category uh, the ability to access healthcare, the extremes of age, um, low income, um, uh, low, low annual income, individuals with disability, sexual and gender minority, sexual orientation, the degrees of education, and whether they're um, located in, in rural areas across our country, um, et cetera. So uh, again, over 80% of our um, of our participants have largely been underrepresented in biomedical research, a really uh, novel opportunity to understand uh, how health and disease manifests in, in people that have largely uh, until now have not shared their data. This is a, um, a snapshot of the, the current data that's available on our researcher uh, workbench. Um, and uh, the, I'll tell you more about the workbench in a second, uh, but over 413,000 uh, survey instruments, data from survey instruments are now available to researchers over 280,000 electronic health records, physical measurements from over 330,000. And our biospecimens have, uh, have, have begun to be converted to data with over 245,000 whole genome sequences, including 1,000 long read sequences. And we have, uh, as you can see on the upper right, um, beginning to amass a, a very unique uh, set of data on um, digital health technologies, predominantly from Fitbits, but also including some uh, data from Apple devices. Um, and we've also been able to do analytics on the genomes to provide information to researchers on structural variants. And um, in addition to the whole genome sequencing, um, we have arrays on over 312,000 individuals. These are the global uh, uh, Illumina global screening arrays that are used. Our data is also dense and longitudinal, and this is a snapshot of of attributes from the electronic health record data going back to the 1980s. So even though individuals began enrolling in the study in 2018 because the EHR data, of course, is historical, 
Um, many individuals uh, actually have data from um, from the time that they were children or certainly early in their early years of life. And you can see the, the density increases, of course, uh, over time to close to the present. But the EHR data not only contains in information about medical conditions, but also medical procedures, medications, other measures um, as well. And at the bottom, you can see information even going back 10 years or more on the Fitbit data, because many of the individuals that have donated their wearable health, digital health technology data have been capturing that data on their devices for many years. So a, a, a growing longitudinal data set that is quite dense and diverse. <coughs> Excuse me. As I mentioned, our genomic data um, uh, consists currently of 245,000 whole genome sequences, and in a paper that was released that was published recently um, last month in Nature, um, this is again a snapshot of, of of what that data has revealed. Over a billion genetic variants are now available for researchers. 151 million have never been reported in any database, and are present in multiple individuals in our data set, with all nearly 2 million um, uh, variants being encoding regions of the genome, potentially having functional consequences. In this paper, uh, there a, a massive replication effort was undertaken to show the quality of our data with over nearly 4,000 variants associated with over 100 conditions in the EHR were replicated in both individuals from European and African ancestries. In this data set, Individuals with whole genome sequence, 99% um, of them also have uh, survey linked survey data as well as physical measurement data. 84% have linked EHR data to their whole genome sequences. And um, as I've mentioned before, 75% uh, uh, of individuals with genome sequence data are also um, uh, uh, from categories that uh, we consider underrepresented in biomedical research or 46% uh, with uh, self-identified as a, as a racial or ethnic minority group. So an incredibly rich data set that hopefully some of you are already using. This is again, another snapshot of, of just the genomic data and comparing the diversity of our genome sequence information with information with uh, the, uh, the status of global uh, GWAS data so as many of you know, um, most genomic data that's available in public databases uh, from uh, genome-wide association studies is largely uh, from individuals of European ancestry or individuals who, who self-identify as white with nearly 95 or 96 percent of those data um, uh, coming from uh, white or European ancestry. But in the blue uh, bars here, you can see how the All of Us data set compares to the GWAS data set available publicly with an enrichment in, um, in information and sequence information from Black, African American, or African, uh, Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish, and even in individuals who self-identify as white or are from also or from your as European ancestry, there's a significant number that are um, previously underrepresented in biomedical research using the categorization I showed you a bit earlier. One of the commitments. Uh, of our program to our participants, as I mentioned, is to return value and to return data. So uh, there are many facets to how we might return results. Uh, the first priority for us is to return genetic information. Um, but secondarily, we're also um, uh, giving our participants information about how they compare to others who have, who have participated in surveys. Eventually, we hope to, um, to sh share with individuals a summary, summary data from their electronic health records, as well as claims data. We, we provide uh, through newsletters and other communications updates to our participants on generalizable study results, uh, publications that have come out, aggregate results from the program, scientific findings that our, our researchers have realized. And uh, we offer any all of our participants the opportunity to participate in additional studies, ancillary studies, as we call them. Uh, so in 2020, we began returning uh, results um, uh, around ancestry and traits that you see at the top. So we report uh, the or uh, based on the genetic data, um, ancestral origins across seven regions of the globe. And we also uh, report, for those who want to see it, information on four um, non-health related traits, the consistency of earwax, bitter taste perception, a preference or not for cilantro, and lactose intolerance. And we began doing that in 2020, as I mentioned. 
in 2022, in December of 2022, so about 14 months ago, we began returning health-related um, results uh, from genome sequencing. And these consist of two reports. One report is called the Medicine and Your DNA Report, um, which highlights genetic variants in seven uh, genes um, that are responsible for um, the metabolism of um, the, the majority of uh, drugs used, uh, the majority of the top used drugs in, across the United States. And you can see the seven pharmacogenes that are reported on here. In addition to which uh, we report um, in the what we call the hereditary uh, disease risk report, uh, we uh, report on genetic variants across 59 genes that have been um, uh, that have been uh, recommended by the American College of Medical Genetic Genetics and Genomics to report um, as uh, secondary findings from genome sequencing. And you can see there's a preponderance of reports around breast or uh, around cancer risk, around cardiovascular disease uh, risk, as well as arrhythmias, as well as some other um, more rare, but um, but importantly, uh, important to report diseases. So these reports began, as I mentioned, in 2000. And 22, the the the, the health related um, reports, and this is a status update on where we are with reporting results to participants as of last month. And you can see on the left the hereditary disease risk report on 59 genes um, was has been offered to over 200,000 of our participants. And I can tell you that as of uh, this week, we are surpassing 100,000 individuals that have received these results. Um, our uh, frequency of reportable genetic variation is is close to uh, 3% with an actionable result. And you can see in this slide um, a snapshot of the kinds of reports that we give to our participants in language that they can understand and then encouraging uh, them to uh, reach out to their healthcare providers so that they can uh, take action on the basis of these results. In the middle, you see the medicine and your DNA report again has been offered to uh, over 200,000 participants. And this too has surpassed 100,000 individuals who have received their results with, in the case of pharmacogenetics, over 93% of our participants have an actionable result. And our data suggests that 30% of those individuals are actually on a medication that could uh, possibly be influenced by the genetic variation uh, that they have. And on the right, um, these are uh, the results from this is the uh, snapshot of our return of data on genetic ancestry and traits with over 260,000 having been offered and nearly 200,000 seeing uh, their genetic ancestry and traits. And right now we're returning data to participants at the rate of 5,000 per week so we can catch up on a, on a backlog that we had when we initiated this activity. If you're interested in uh, accessing this data yourself, and hopefully some of you have already done this, uh, for one, uh, we have um, we have several tiers of access uh, to our uh, uh, our workbench, and you can use the QR code at the upper right to um, to learn more about this. But the public tier is available to everybody anytime, uh, so you can go to the, our public tier data and make queries. I'll show you a snapshot of that in just a moment, and then um, with additional um, modules of training. Um, uh, particularly around privacy, security, and, um, and, and risk to participants, uh, you can join the registered tier, which allows uh, for uh, more in-depth data on, as you can see, surveys, electronic health records, and physical measures, and wearables. And there are some um, confusion matrices in that, that that obfuscate dates and things that would make uh, individuals more readily identifiable. And at a higher tier of access, we call the control tier. These are uh, and these are um, uh, data that that, that could um, uh, potentially lead to um, identifiability, but um, we put safeguards in to prevent that. And uh, this largely is uh, related to genomic data and some of our health and lifestyle surveys, which uh, which have dates and and uh, potentially identifiable information. So, uh, if your institution, if your organization has a data use and research agreement, it's an umbrella agreement that allows anybody who belongs to that institution to access our workbench. And as you can see, the lower right international access is now available as of December of 2023. This is a, um, a snapshot of what our public data browser looks like. Um, uh, I think if you go to the QR code on the lower left, you'll 
you'll you'll end up there. And in this case, um, we're doing a search on heart failure across all of the available data that's available in our uh, uh, curated data repository. You can see that 50 uh, conditions uh, come up uh, in the uh, EHR domains for heart failure. And this is a snapshot of the kinds of data you want if you're doing um, some initial uh, pre-research work to learn whether a cohort is available for you to use. This is the kind of data you might see in the public tier with 25,000 or so individuals with heart failure. And then a number of subcategorizations of the types of heart failure that are available through SNOMED codes and ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes. So on the left, you can see the kinds of summary data that's available in the public tier. There's EHR data. You can actually query on the frequency and distribution of genomic variants. There's some survey data, physical measurements. No, um, no, no, nothing is required. There's no login. It's very easy to at least get your feet wet and, and learn what's in the data set. We also, um, relevant to this audience in particular, um, began, uh, um, 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 began uh, with access to international researchers in December of 2023. It's always been a goal of our uh, program to have uh, global access. We believe that this is super important because frankly, the more eyes on our data, the more valuable, the more uh, likely it is that there'll be innovation creation and, and discovery. Um, we also think this is an opportunity for researchers around the world to take data from their local cohorts and validate them in ours, so cross-validation we think is is really important uh, as an impetus for scientific collaboration and exchange, and um, also to really think about our commitment not uh, to uh, diversity of data and diversity of research. We're hoping that um, at least our platform along with IACC and other organizations will form the basis for a vibrant international community that's collaborating and accelerating science in the in the um, in the service of advancing health, global health, and precision medicine, and you can see on the right uh, current uh, data on where our data use agreements uh, exist and where researchers are now actively using uh, the workbench. We hope certainly to expand this. We we still see we see some activity in low middle income countries in South America and Africa and some parts of Asia, but we hope that this will be um, expanded greatly over the coming. Uh, weeks, months, and, and years, and include many of you that are on uh, today's seminar. Uh, this was a milestone week for us. Um, I mentioned our goal of two, for 2026 to have, was to have a vibrant community of 10,000 researchers at the workbench. Well, we exceeded 10,000 researchers this week at our workbench, so about two and a half years earlier than expected through the data use uh, and research agreements we have with over 700 institutions now around the world. And you can see that um, uh, the kinds of institutions we're talking about, there's largely academic, but not-for-profit organizations, health organizations. And um, we do anticipate um, expanding our opportunities to commercial organizations, hopefully sometime later this year or early next year. I want to talk to you about the scientific directions for the All of Us Research Program. As uh, Chief Medical and Scientific Officer, this has been a major focus of uh, the attention of myself and our group, and really um, see if we can bring to life the mission statement that you see on this slide, which I showed you earlier, which is the mission statement for the for the program. The reason for having a scientific priorities roadmap for from our perspective is it allows us to really drive exceptional opportunities for breakthrough science, and we really want to see that vibrant research community I've 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 told you about. Uh, achieving medical breakthroughs and, and changing the way, uh, eventually changing the way medicine is practiced to be more efficient and precise. The anchors uh, for the scientific roadmap that we've developed come from uh, at the left is a report that was delivered um, to the director of NIH in 2015. At that time, it was Francis Collins. This was the advisory committee to the director report or ACD report. It's really a blueprint or almost like the constitution, if you will, uh, for the program, really um, setting in place uh, guiding principles and aspirational science that the program could achieve. So this was foundational for us in considering what we wanted to do scientifically. Secondly, um, we recognize that our program has a chance to address major issues that are affecting morbidity and mortality in our country across the diversity of our population in the U.S. So in the middle, you see 
um, a snapshot of the um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's report on mortality in the United States. So really focusing on, on, the, on the key pain points for healthcare delivery. And on the right, we really wanted to take full advantage of as, as, attributes that are, um, we believe, unique to the All of Us Research Program comparative, compared to other uh, uh, large longitudinal population studies, even in the United States. So the so one being our scalability and scalability of whole genome sequencing, eventually to be a million genome sequences available to researchers, and the use, use of electronic health record data, as well as wearable data as a way to do deep phenotyping that is, uh, un, again, un, un, um, unachievable, has not been achieved in other uh, and other types of longitudinal population studies. Engagement with our participant as true partners in the research, learning from them and listening to them about how we're gonna conduct our program and our research objectives, and then uh, scale in diversity and scale and diversity, um, meaning our commitment, as I've mentioned to you before about uh, of uh, over over sampling individuals that have been previously underrepresented in biomedical research. So where we ended up is um, uh, is one, what you're going to see here is the scientific priorities roadmap for the All of Us Research Program. And this is really a high level view. Um, time will not really permit me to go into all the details of what we're trying to do. But you'll note um, in this uh, top bar here uh, that our we want to keep our eyes on uh, advancing precision health, medicine, and equity in developing novel tools for risk assessment diagno diagnosis and novel therapeutics for everyone. And the way uh, that we're um, aiming to achieve this is first by starting with the, um, the massive amount of data that's available um, at our research at Workbench that I've also already mentioned to you. So the electronic health record data, the survey data, the rich physical measures and phenotypic information achieved through EHRs and, and digital health technologies complemented by uh, genomic data as, as well as other um, uh, assays from biospecimens. And sitting on top of this uh, vast amount of data is a toolbox um, that, uh, that is currently being expanded to allow optimal utility of our data in the service of the science that we want to do. Um, the next level of, of opportunity that we see is to understand fundamental drivers of, of exposures that lead to health and disease transitions. And we've landed on really four areas of exposures and drivers. We have an opportunity to really take a deep dive into uh, aspects of lifestyle, sleep, physical activity, uh, and diet that impact individuals' um, health and, and well-being, and as well as their behaviors. We see a, a formidable opportunity in learning about environmental exposures and how environmental exposures uh, can also uh, lead to changes in health or uh, instigate health to disease, disease transitions. We have a commitment to health equity, but in the scientific realm, we think about health inequities as a, as a, as a major social stressor that will contribute to our perturbations in health and uh, trajectories of health uh, and trajectories in disease, and then of course there's the fundamental genetics that were that that we harbor and the biology that it dictates. So these um, are all our four strategic air focus areas that we're committed to in um, in science in, to advance the science of our understanding of health and health of disease transitions, and to explore how each of these either alone or in combination with one another can result in outcomes. And those outcomes are on the left. You can see the, uh, we're trying to rep, um, focus on uh, prevalent uh, and rare health conditions. And the prevalent common conditions are those that I mentioned uh, that are uh, been highlighted by the CDC's report on morbidity and mortality. But we don't want to lose sight of the fact that, um, particularly with a million participants, we have significant numbers of individuals with relatively rare conditions like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia, and, at, and data around those conditions that allow us to potentially even gain novel insights into those rare conditions. With the advent of pediatrics to our, um, to our program, we have a significant ability now uh, for the first time to, to uh, look at maternal and child health, not just... Um, during pregnancy, but the early years of life. And that leads to 
uh, what you see on the uh, uh, on the right is healthy aging and resilience across the lifespan. And this has really been called out across the National Institutes of Health as a, as a top priority to really understand uh, life transitions from newborn to toddler to adolescent to young adult to young uh, young young adult and middle age and and the aged and to try to really understand uh, how individuals age across all the all of those phases of life. And then on the right hand side is something that's really unique to our program because we're returning results and help, and information that could be actionable to our participants. We really want to understand how individuals. Um, use those results in the service of their own decisions around health, as well as how, as an aggregate, um, these might in, uh, end up influencing population health. Which leads again to the to um, the final uh, sort of uh, um, area of, of of importance here is we are a research program, and everything that you see in the scientific uh, framework and roadmap is research. But we are committed to translation, so working with uh, other government agencies, with industry partners, with health systems, with policymakers, and even payers, uh, we see this is the um, on our critical path to achieving the goals of individual and population health improvement through the advancement of precision health and medicine. And I do also want to not lose sight of the fact that this is a heuristic uh, program. In other words, uh, there's a, a, a virtuous cycle of um, data leading to insights insights feeding back into the system and generating new hypotheses so that we envision the scientific roadmap as something that will um, that will continually uh, live and evolve over time. And we welcome uh, your input and contributions uh, to this roadmap as you dive into our data. So that was a lot, but I just wanted to highlight for you, um, uh, you know, where we're, where we're going scientifically with, with the program. And if you, I, if you, uh, if this were a web-based interface, which it's not, but it will be, and you um, clicked on the on the cell that says genetics and biology, there's even a deeper dive with some of the questions that we want to see our communities address. So the, defining the genetic architecture of disease across race, ethnicities, or ancestral groups across um, that are served by the program. Uh, um, enhancing our understanding of the causal variants of the uh, ACMG health-related genes or pharmacogenetic gene, pharmacogenetic related genes that are present in underrepresented populations that are largely uh, absent from publicly available data, uh, databases, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through uh, all of these in great detail, but um, what you see on the, on, in, in the first three that um, are listed here are opportunities that we think are available today for any of you to begin to help us address. And we, we also will be uh, using this roadmap in order to stimulate um, the science that we're that we're interested in through funding opportunities uh, through tr more traditional NIH and other mechanisms. So this is coming to a, a website on our research and workbench. It's not there yet, but hopefully you'll see it there uh, sometime in the next few months. I just also want to highlight for you as, uh, that I I have some priorities. I want to see us do do some things uh, as quickly as possible and get out of the blocks with some super important areas of research. And not these are not necessarily small areas, but as I mentioned, we, we really want to begin to uh, tease out the genetic ar architecture for common and rare diseases in the United States. We know that this will lead to um, better diagnostic tools, better predictive, uh, uh, predictive risk algorithms, and potentially to novel therapeutics, for, for individ and particularly for individuals that are largely um, underserved by uh, current therapeutics. Uh, we're committed to an ability, and I'll show you more on this in a few moments, to study the impact of climate, environment, as well as social determinants of health, which are environmental influences on health and disease, and to uh, think about how that how that research will lead to policy changes, as well as a pol influence policy around climate and the environment, as well as deliver actionable results to individuals and their communities. And then lastly, we're, um, we're developing a, a robust outcomes research agenda um, as a, we call it downstream of return of results. In other words, what happens after an individual receives genetic information? At scale, we have an opportunity to really understand how that influences health outcomes as well as potentially economic outcomes in ways that have previously um, been unachievable. So these are um, my three type priorities uh, 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 for the foreseeable future from our scientific priorities roadmap. 
I just wanted to spend a few moments highlighting for you just a couple of uh, examples of the scientific impact that we've already had. And these are through publications largely uh, both from our community. But first and foremost, um, about a month ago, um, it was a, a watershed moment in a, in, a, in a very positive way for the program to publish four papers in nature journals as well as one in communications biology. So in the upper left-hand um, paper is in nature medicine. And this was really a statement from the institutes and center directors of the of the NIH about the value proposition for the All of Us Research Program to essentially um, lift all of their uh, strategies forward. So this is really a commitment of NIH to, uh, to to leverage the investment that's been made in the All of Us Research Program. In the upper right, in the communications biology paper, um, was an illustration of the fact that um, there's really gaps in our publicly available data on underrepresented um, uh, and, 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 and and various uh, ancest ancest ancestral groups uh, when it comes to uh, ACMG genes in particular. So in this paper, um, uh, the frequency of of pathogenic variation was was very high was uh, was comparable in individuals of European ancestry, but was much lower. Uh, in individuals from other ancestries, indicating uh, that there are gaps in our understanding of the variants that contribute to risk in those um, in in, uh, in in diverse populations. Uh, in the middle is a pa nature paper on uh, that used all of us data to tease out uh, genetic heterogeneity in type two diabetes, um, uh, identifying eight different uh, uh, pathogen patho um, pathobiologic subtypes. Uh, leading to um, uh, uh, causes of cardiovascular and other vascular uh, uh, phenotypes in the long term. So essentially, uh, potentially taking type 2, type 2 diabetes and substratifying into eight subtypes that could lead to different diagnostic and therapeutic opportunities. Um, on the lower left is a paper that was done um, um, collaboratively between the and I, NHGRI Emerge Network, uh, as well as the All of Us Research Program to uh, develop and validate uh, polygenic risk scores for uh, 10 common conditions uh, across um, a variety of populations. So really a step forward for the polygenic risk uh, community. And in the lower right is a marker paper on the genomic data. I showed you some of the uh, data from that um, paper a little earlier. So this was really a, a fantastic uh, day. It was all the all five of these papers were published on February 19th. I wanted to also highlight um, uh, some of the work that we're doing to uh, demonstrate data quality. And uh, we do a lot of uh, what we call demonstration projects. They're really not meant to be novel discovery projects, but we're but they're really meant to highlight the fact that we can uh, reproduce results that have been achieved in other cohorts, perhaps. And in this case, uh, this is. Uh, a, a survey of uh, GWAS data, uh, looking at some fairly common traits such as height and lipid levels, as well as atrial fibrillation type two diabetes, and really showing how genetic variants that were previously understood to be relevant to these um, phenotypes would be reproducible, um, you know, between the all of us data cohort and cohorts such as the UK Biobank and others. So we do a lot of that, um, th this type of research inside the program and with our uh, consortium partners to just to make sure that everybody uh, believes that the data is of the sufficient quality and robustness to uh, carry out on uh, novel discovery research. Um, this is a, a, um, a paper I did want to highlight because uh, it's uh, it's it really is one of the uses of large cohort data to look for protective variants um, against uh, APOL1 mediated chronic chronic kidney disease in individuals from African ancestry. And in this paper, the N264K variant, which is a functional variant in APOL1, was shown to be was shown to be associated with reduced uh, chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease um, in both the uh, Million Veterans Program cohort, um, a, a cohort called BioView from which is from Vanderbilt University in the United States, as well as in the All of Us Research Program. And the composite of these data, which is, I think, quite striking, uh, suggests the possibility of developing therapeutics that could protect against chronic kidney disease in this population. So um, an important, uh, I think, milestone in 
the possibility of uh, achieving precision therapeutics um, in the long run for uh, using all of us, as well as uh, data from other uh, large scale population studies. This is a um, uh, data that um, data that came out in 2022 using some of our early uh, step count data from Fitbits, and uh, in individuals that had been followed with with their uh, step count data for um, more than six years. Uh, what you can see on on the right um, hand side in this in this plot is a uh, across the board really. Um, an association, an inverse association between incident chronic disease and uh, step counts with uh, the data showing that if individuals who walked 8,200 steps per day had significantly reduced incidence of depression, sleep apnea, gastro, um, um, uh, uh, gastro, 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 gastroenteric, gastroenteric reflux disease or GERD, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. So um, potentially validating um, what we thought would be true, but in a much more rigorous way using the combination of, uh, of the step count data from our program, as well as the electronic health record data. And during the, uh, um, uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, there was an opportunity to look at pre and post uh, pandemic um, activity. Uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a graph of of seasonal variation in um, in step counts um, pre uh, COVID, and then what happens uh, after COVID? Um, the, uh, the 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 counterfactual model is really a predictive model of what step count should be. The observed model is what's seen in gray, and there's a significant reduction in step counts after uh, the pandemic compared to what was predicted. And interestingly, on the right. And this was really not associated with a large number of uh, demographic uh, variables, but more importantly, was um, with uh, stress um, as well as um, mental health and socioeconomic stress, um, mental health and and geography. So um, potentially, uh, uh, you know, a, a a finding that really tells us something about the status of of how the how pandemic and major um, insults like that can have an impact on individuals' uh, lifestyle um, and uh, and health. Um, so I just wanted to close with uh, thinking about where we're going as a program, really what is next. Uh, first, I mentioned uh, earlier that we are uh, committed to uh, what we're calling ancillary, stud ancillary studies that increase the um, the data types that are available in uh, as part of our core data set. So in this triangle on the left, at the base, you can see we, we're just trying to represent the core data set that's uh, coming from our core protocol. And we've done three ancillary studies uh, uh, to date, or we've initiated three ancillary studies. One is complete. We did a COVID serology study, which um, was which used our biospecimens to generate um, data on uh, antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 and learn about the distribution um, and timing of, of uh, infection in, across our cohort. Uh, we also launched uh, uh, in 2023 uh, both the Exploring the Mind uh, program, which is a series of cognitive tests available through a uh, web interface and an app interface uh, to, that are available to our participants. And then at the top is a much more um, uh, involved study uh, we call Nutrition for Precision Health, which is done being collab a collaborative study with over 15 institutes and centers of the United States, as well as our common fund. And on the right is an article that was written in the Washington Post a couple of months ago about this study, which really aims to um, deliver on the, on, the, on the possibility of using algorithms to determine um, you know, how an individual uh, how uh, how uh, individuals will respond to particular dietary nu nutrients and really begin to tailor uh, diet to, to individual backgrounds and and uh, enable um, in nutrition for precision health. Um, the other thing that we've done uh, starting in um, uh, this past fall was um, we stood up a center for linkage and acquisition of data. And what this uh, center is aiming to do is uh, forge data linkages um, um, from databases that are available externally 
to our participants. So as you can see in the middle uh, and the top, one of the first things we're doing is we're capturing uh, residential history and location data so that we can begin to harness geospatial data, link geospatial data. And uh, some of the geospatial data of significant interest is in the environmental realm. So we're starting with uh, linkages to the CDC's Environmental Justice Index, and then we'll go on to uh, other data sources that report on other types of environmental influences, both from the National Association, uh, uh, National, uh, at NASA and NOAA, um, as well as um, uh, working with uh, with repositories of, of claims data to to uh, enhance our electronic health record through health healthcare claims, as well as mortality data. And we're going to try to do this for all of our participants across the lifespan. So we are going to be asking. Uh, we we are have we will be asking our participants to give us a a life course uh, series of locations and addresses uh, that they have lived in, as well as capturing some of these data from uh, at least national databases that are um, available in the United States. And what this enables, at least first and foremost, is our ability to begin to address some of the questions in environmental exposures and health. So for our entire cohort on the left, we're, as I mentioned, we're collecting location data um, through the Center for Linkage and Acquisition of Data. We're gonna link um, uh, location data to um, environmental data that you see in the middle. We're also have already collected social determinants of health data and other form of environmental exposures. And we're, also, we're going to release a environmental exposure and occupational health survey in early 2025, all in the service of learning more about uh, environmental influences on health. And we're going to do this for the entire cohort. In a subset on the right, we're going to be doing an exposomics study with the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, and we're focusing initially on type 2 diabetes. And what we mean by exposo exposomics is really utilization of high-resolution mass spectroscopy to tease out um, either the way that environmental influences perturb metabolic profiles or and or to learn what's uh, residing in uh, low, low um, not in um, molecular manifestations of environmental exposures, which are in measures, direct measures of the exposure that an individual had to a particular environmental influence. So this exposomic study is just being initiated as we speak, and we hope um, again to have data available to researchers probably in 2026 from high resolution mass spectroscopy as well as the linkage data that you, other linkage data and, and, and survey data that you see on this slide. So um, again, to close up, I wanna just um, invite you all uh, to a researchers convention uh, that we're holding uh, next week. The link is uh, on this slide if you care to join us. Uh, we'll have keynote speakers from, uh, from the UK Biobank as well as from the All of Us Research Program. And this is a real opportunity for our researchers to come together virtually and highlight the advances that they've been making uh, using using data over the last couple of years. I also want to uh, acknowledge um, the uh, amazing uh, consortium that we have built, and as you can see, it's um, it's uh, it's quite extensive. Uh, we have a platform, we have uh, awards and uh, and partners that are contributing to our ability to to um, to work with participants to engage them to be a, an interface with them. We also have a number of awardees that we call our health provider organization network that you see across the middle that is across the United States and is quite extensive, including major academic centers as well as community uh, clinics and other, other um, uh, locations to achieve outreach. And then at the bottom, you can see the vast amount of awardees that are responsible for both capturing our data, curating it, delivering it to the researchers, that's the data and research center that you see in the middle, our biobank, as well as the partners that we're uh, working with to uh, curate it and, and, um, and deliver our genomic uh, data and other data to, to participants, particularly the groups that you can see in the lower right. I also want to acknowledge the vast network of community partners that um, that really represent um, the diversity that we're trying to achieve and have helped us learn how to both engage and retain individuals from uh, cultural, uh, religious, and demographic backgrounds that um, are so important to to our study. And with that, I'll 
thank you and thank you for having me today. And I'm uh, happy to take some questions if, if that's possible. Thank you, Jeff, for this insightful presentation. I think uh, Peter is here to moderate the QA, uh, QA session. Peter, is uh, back to you. Well, while people are thinking, I'll just say yes. uh, again that I would yeah. love to make sure that uh, any of you that are have not been familiar with our program uh, can um, can join both as, uh, as researchers in particular. It's a wonderful session, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All the data are available in the Indian population or Asian population. Did you ask rare, genetic rare diseases? I'm sorry, what's the question? Uh, I have typed it in chat oh, box. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't in see chat the... box, there, there are my questions. The answer, oh, I see. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I wasn't paying attention to the, to hey. the chat, but um, we have a, uh, Probably our Asian population is is where our one of our largest challenges. I think you saw that uh, currently our population is three percent Asian. I can't tell you off the top of my head how many uh, come from India. Um, but um, even among those, I am sure that we will have rare disease data on rare diseases. So if that's an interest of yours, I would encourage you to go in and and uh, learn what's there, but also teach us what's missing, because we would like to be able to address your questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I think there is Gabriela Repito who, who, who wants to who raise her hand. Please go ahead. Thank you, Latifa. Uh, so Jeff, this is a fantastic talk. Um, um, really inspirational. Um, so I, I want to ask you if you see a role for all of us or, or the other large cohort studies um, to partner with either institutions or even countries with limited resources to, to really advise on uh, on how, you know, whether it's possible to do this at, uh, at scale in, in, in other regions. And um, along with that, you know, this is a very complex and comprehensive program. So what would you say what, um, would be like the three main components that could, um, um, really drive health benefits in, in other settings. Thank you. So the uh, for your first question, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we are already uh, working with uh, groups in Africa to help them stand, ha ha help African continental cohorts um, get stood up. Uh, certainly happy to work with uh, your teams in South America as well. We think that there's a lot of communal learnings that we would have, and I would encourage, uh, you know, partly to your second question is that we all use uh, similar standards and data. So the, all of us uh, survey data um, is full, freely available to anybody who wants to use it. So taking our, our surveys as we launch them and launch them in your own um, in your own cohort so that we can have harmonization would be, I think, quite valuable. I think uh, the other thing is com as community getting together, particularly through the IHCC and uh, really working with groups that can implement the research findings to achieve health benefit is something that I, I know the GGMC is 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 focused on and and we should probably you know double down on that uh, in my opinion as cohort leaders. Um, the, and the other thing is uh, the other in, in terms of standards, there's a uh, we uh, electronic health records I know are not ubiquitous, but where they are, I think if we can adopt the same standards of using that data, we use the OMOP data standard, the common data model, which I think will facilitate a lot of fluidity of data uh, discovery and replication across cohorts, which is, uh, as, as you heard me say, is really an important feature of accelerating the science. So those are a few um, high level answers to your question. There's a lot more detail we can go into uh, separately if you'd like. Maybe we can take more question, we, even though we, we don't have enough time, but please go ahead, uh, Sonia. 
Yes. Um, thank you so much for this um, wonderful talk. Um, yeah, um, I'm dialing from 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 Doha, um, and my question is: um, in pediatric, what is the number of of of, of individuals that you're actually aiming to recruit? Yeah, 150,000 is our goal. Um, so we just started with um, newborn to six years of age. Um, that's our first. Uh, we're going to expand from seven to 13 years of age, and then eventually from 14 to 18 over the next couple of years with 150,000 as at least our initial target. And I mean, going back in the electronic health record data that I showed you where individuals came in where uh, as 18 or older, um, there is a tens of thousands already that that we that effectively have pediatric data even though they joined us as an adult okay and just one question um on the return of results um that you are doing and and those um uh, reports that you actually kind of um get ready um is that is the information given by a genetic counselor or just send that information to, how, how is it telemedicine how, how did you manage to, to, to because these are very large numbers so yeah um i'm just curious it is a telegenetic counseling. Uh, we actually partner with a, a a group called Color Health in the United States. Yep. Uh, they, uh, when individuals agree or request to get their results back, we actually have the um, the variants confirmed in a clinical lab. And genetic counselor telegenetic counseling is done by Color Health for everybody who requests it, and it's available both in English and in Spanish. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, we can take another question from Jennifer before making the uh, announcement for the upcoming uh, events. Yeah, please, Jennifer, go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Ginsburg. Um, that was actually, Sonia asked the some of the questions I was going to ask about the ECMG59 genes. Um, I assume they need to be clinically confirmed, which it sounds like, yes, that is the case. Um, so those resources to get that clinical confirmation, that's all done as part of all of us. It's not put back on like the local healthcare provider to do? That is correct. We we effectively pay for it all. Um, the genetic counseling is free. The replication testing is free to our participants. And um, the if there's a burden, if you want to call it that, it's what happens afterwards. You know, if a, if a person wants to uh, seek um, clinical care because they have risk of BR, you know, BRCA reported risk, uh, of course, that is now um, something that they're uh, going to be working through with their healthcare providers and healthcare systems. But the initial testing and counseling is all free. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Jeff, if you don't mind to stay for a few minutes, because we have some question here in the message, in the text box. And one of them is from Amira Akil. She's uh, said, great talk, Jeff. Any Middle Eastern population in all of us courts? There is. It's it's small. Um, and um, I seem to uh, we did an, uh, a survey of this uh, earlier uh, in the fall. And I I believe uh, amongst the 500,000 or so for which there is data on our workbench, uh, 3000 uh, are coming from Middle Eastern countries. So this is an area where we hope that we can increase um, from drawing off Middle Eastern populations in the United States, but also work collaboratively with cohorts in the Middle East to accelerate the science in those areas as well. Yeah, I think uh, Teji also uh, asking, uh, does, I mean, following up on the same question and also how to engage with those populations. So I'd like to follow up on that and just say if there's any advice from our, our um, audience on how all of us could engage with those particular populations you're asking about in the United States, um, instead of just linking to existing cohorts, how do you um, actually find where those the the larger populations are in the United States of of Asian Americans or Middle Eastern Americans and reach out to them and and really um, have a concerted effort? And so, any advice to the All of Us program from our um, audience would be would be valuable. Thank you. I put my email in the chat if anybody wants to be in touch with me about um, anything we talked about and 
some of the things that Teji has recommended, I'd be uh, happy to follow up with any of you. Thank you again for uh, for having me today. I'm sorry we went over a little bit um, yeah. and I look forward to uh, continuing to follow the educational series that Latifa and Scott and others have put on. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for this insightful uh, presentation. And I uh, just have uh, two quick announcements. Uh, the first one is about the upcoming educational webinar series. It's going to be John's presentation by Amy, Amy Nissel and Browning Terrell. And the date is going to be April 23rd at uh, 6 30, at, uh, actually, sorry, it's going to be 6.30 p.m. Sorry, I did not correct this one, but I will send you the invites. And the reason for putting the dates in late afternoon in order to accommodate our participants from Australia and the Asia region. And the second event is uh, the precise ICC conference. It's gonna take place in Singapore on from April 21st to April, sorry, from August 21st to August 23rd. And I put on the text box, the registration link so if you have any information please contact uh, us and i'm gonna put also here my email so you can send me information about the webinar and i can also give you more information for the conference okay so i'm putting here my email as well and thank you again for your participation Thanks, Latifa. Thanks, Thank you, Joe. everyone. Thank you again, and we'll see you during the next webinar. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a great day or a great afternoon. Bye-bye.